Hello, good evening to you. Welcome. This is Ghana Tonight. We're live from our news about Tadesa Wekanda. Also live on TV Ghana on Facebook, DSV Channel 279, all across the world on 3news.com. I am Alfred Okansi. Tonight. As we're getting the issues as Labour reacts to John Domani Mahana's plea for a honeymoon. Should the National Democratic Congress win the 2024 presidential election? It would appear the labor unions are not in sync with the NDC's flabberous call, but we would understand exactly where the concern is. And also be joined by uh, President of the Money Africa, Franklin Kujo, uh, when his thoughts on this labor reactions to this. Also, we have an exclusive tonight here on Ghana Tonight. We take you live to that particular location which has become a subject of controversy following allegations that Minister for Works and House in Francis and Zubuachi and the Judicial Service sold a state property as a former residence of the late Justice Mafo Sao. We are at that location of the former Justice of the Supreme Court Mafo Sao's residence. What is happening there will tell you. Stay with us here on Ghana tonight. Your election command centre continues uh, to build up to the new Presidential Party's parliamentary primary scheduled for January 27. Tonight we'll tell you what to expect as the Appeals Committee has submitted its report to the General Secretary of the NPP, Justin Kodio Frimpong. Who qualifies and who doesn't? Stay with us. We'll get into it, as always, here on Ghana tonight. We're also monitoring quite closely what's happening in the Northern region, uh, specifically with respect to the NDC. We understand uh, some members of the NDC in the Northern region have gone to lock up the party's office there. We have a development because we understand the party, the national executives, is taking an action right now and there's a possible suspension of one of the executives there in the northern region. Stay with me. We'll get into it on Ghana tonight. So as your thoughts and views, comments and opinions are welcome on Ghana tonight. The hashtag is Ghana tonight on Facebook and X. Let's get talking. Let's settle for Ghana Briefs. The Seventh-day Adventist Church is proposing a constitutional reform to change the 2024 elections dates from Saturday, December 7. In a petition to the Attorney General, the church proposed that the election be held on either the first or second Tuesday of November to promote inclusive democracy. The SDA Church also argues a change to the election calendar from December 7 will prevent future elections occurring on religious days of worship. This latest move follows an earlier engagement the church had last year with the Electoral Commission and other stakeholders, including the National Chief Imam, over the same proposal. Another year, more endless rounds of job search for major graduates. Finding a job is often a top priority for many when the year starts, with many stories bone crushing rejections, but also stories of hope about how some found their true calling. After my service, I tried a few companies sending my CVs to them personally walking, you know, on the streets of Accra, you know, circle areas and, and some other areas. None of them called. We do not have any hope now that we are going to be employed because nursing is a hierarchy. So 2019 year batch that completed are at home. 2020 year batch at home and I completed in 2021 and I'm home. What is that unique quality that you are bringing? There are 10 people with degrees. We are looking for a certain role. How do you show up on your CV? How do you show up in person? What kind of skills have you built for yourself? We need to begin to build networks. People need to volunteer their time a lot more. People need to serve a lot more because it's still again the issue of divider. At the end of the day, you need to separate yourself from everyone else. Some disgruntled members of the National Democratic Congress in the Northern Region have locked up the party's regional office. 
This is in a protest of the arrest of a regional vice chairman of the party, Al Haji Abdul Hamid, who allegedly assaulted the party's regional treasurer, Hajia Shamima Yakubu. The group raised all offices at the regional headquarters with wood and padlocks. <laughs> A former speaker of the legislature and member of the NPP's Council of Elders, Professor Mike Okwe says the party must call a central member of parliament, Kennedy Ejapon, to order. It follows what some have described as unprovoked attacks by the defeated flag bearer hopeful on Bantama MP and housing minister, Francis Asensobwache, and his call on delegates to reject the minister during the party's primaries. Kennedy Ejapon made a public statement that the election was free and fair in the interest of the party i will think that the elders which i'm one of and the national executive must put it on the agenda to ensure that everybody is put to a certain order so that there'll be peace and harmony for the next <laughs> The two interdicted union executives of the Tema Oil Refinery say the interdiction can never stop them from pushing for a better deal for the refinery. Anthony Joji Kumsen and Sewa Duncan Williams allege this is an agenda by the board and management to pursue a deal fraught with illegalities and inconsistencies. Union work is not myself and Sewa alone. We have executives. So when we got the document, we actually held a series of meetings with our executive page by page and we looked at the document critically so we established the positions and the issues in the document that were given to us and so it's bit our understanding for the board to now draw the conclusion that um, the leakage in the public domain came from us <laughs> Well, there's more news on 3news.com. Make some time and visit 3news.com. This is Ghana Tonight. Coming up next, we'll take you live to the area, that particular location, which has become a subject of controversy following allegations that a minister of works and housing, Francis Asensobwache, who is a member of parliament for the Bantama constituency and the judicial service, sold a state property as the residents of the, the late Justice Marfo Sal. Now, we've got a copy of a contract, a response from the judicial service, as well as the videos of this particular location. Now, stay with me closely and, and follow me every step of the way, because what we're going to do tonight is to put some matters in, in perspective. If you recall yesterday, I'm going to play back that portions of that interview I had with the Honorable Rashid Pelpo, who is the ranking member on the Lands and Forestry Committee of Parliament, who was very clear yesterday that as a committee, they don't have enough information about this redevelopment program that government is on, and, and that has led to the demolition of some old government buildings in prime areas like Cantonments, Osu, Rage, and Ringway and, and th those are the places that you have seen. And in place of these old buildings, that state buildings that were there, we're seeing some residential facilities, some high-rise apartments coming up in those places. It raises fundamental questions about transparency. Now, over the weekend, we, there was a video that making the rounds that had Kenny Japon made a specific allegation against Francis Asensubuachi about the residents of the late Justice Mafosal, that that residential facility has been sold to a private developer. And the fact that there's some redevelopment going on there. Now, this is the controversial matter that we're not taking our eyes off tonight in the interest of you and I, the Ghanaian people. Now, you, you recall that, that Ministry for Works and Housing statement dismissing the claims by Kennedy Japan, since Central Member of Parliament, that Francis Asensobuache had attempted to acquire one of the properties, but was stopped by the, the Chief Justice. Now, the Sin Central MP, whose brother is contesting the minister in the upcoming primaries in the Bantama constituency, is not backing down. And he maintains the minister attempted to acquire the property. 
That's Kenny Japan's position. He's maintained this. Now, we have seen a copy of an agreement between the Ministry of Works and Housing and the Judicial Service. Okay? We have, we have secured a copy of that agreement. Here are some of the details. Take a look at this. This was first signed on the 17th of February, 2023. The Ministry is to take possession of two properties allocated to the Judicial Service located at Onyasia Close. That's Roman Ridge. Right? And that is where we're going to take you to uh, on Ghana tonight. Stay with me. Because it is that location that Justice Mafosau's residential facility is located. Roman Ridge. Now, ministry, that's the Minister of Works and Houghton, is to provide temporary accommodation for two judges during the redevelopment of these facilities. Upon completion, the judicial service will be given four bungalows. The agreement expires upon completion of construction of the four properties, the four bungalows. And these are portions of the agreement that the judicial service entered into uh, with the Ministry of Works and Housing about this redevelopment project. And that residential facility of the late Justice Mafasal is part of this agreement, we understand, between the judicial service and the ministry, which has led to that building being demolished, right, and some redevelopment going on there. Now, the judicial service of Ghana also responded to the allegations of this sale of the state property, in which the judicial service was mentioned, and we have a, a copy of that statement. They say, on December 28, 2022, the judicial service received a letter and, and keep this in mind, they received a letter from the Ministry of Works and Housing expressing the desire to implement a government redevelopment scheme within Onyasia Close, Roman Ridge, Accra. Now, the two properties that had been allocated by the Ministry of Works and Housing to the judicial service and which previously had been occupied by the late Justice Samuel Mafosal and his Lordship Justice Victor Ofoy, retired, fell within the redevelopment enclave. Now, the plan under government's redevelopment scheme, as expressed to the judicial service, was to increase the housing stock in the enclave within a two-year period from the date of handover of the properties to the Ministry of Works and Housing. Upon completion of the project, four housing units were to be allocated to the judicial service for use by the Superior Court judges. The Judicial Service accepted the offer from the Ministry of Works and Housing, recognizing the serious accommodation deficit faced by the judiciary, whilst taking into consideration the security and safety requirements of judges, and also convinced that the project will be beneficial to the Judicial Service. Now, following a series of meetings between representatives of government, Judicial Service, and the Ministry of Works and Housing regarding the two properties mentioned above. That is the Justice Malfus House property and, and, and then the other judge, judge, judge who is also mentioned has gone on retirement. Data 17 February 2023. This agreement was entered into between the Judicial Service and Ministry of Works and Housing to proceed with the redevelopment project. Development on the said land are therefore covered by an agreement concluded between the Judicial Service and the Ministry of Works and Housing. Now, th this is what the judicial service statement also communicated about this, this whole controversial facility. It, it, in part, it confirms the contract that we showed earlier, which we have secured a copy of uh, as well. Now, the fundamental question that needs to be answered is, now we do know that it is the ministry that approached the judicial service to have these two facilities, one belonging to Justice Mafosa, which is the subject of controversy that Kennedy Japon mentioned, to have it redeveloped. Now, Parliament is also saying that, you know what, we don't, we don't have much information about this redevelopment program that government is on to redevelop areas, prime areas, where government or state buildings, old state buildings were located. What we did here on Ghana tonight, 
is to go beyond the statement and get to these, this particular area where Justice Marfosau, the late Justice Marfosau's residential facility was, which has been demolished and some redevelopment taking place. We visited the area just this evening, in fact, some three hours ago. Take a look at this. This is the area that's become subject of controversy over the past few days. And this is what we gathered. Per the information given to us by the neighbors of the facility, the late Justice Mafosa resided in one of the, the two demolished houses, as you can see on the screen there, prior to his demise. In fact, it is not the only building that has been demolished. So, so this confirms that it's indeed some work by the Ministry of Works and Housing. We saw notices on the construction site that this is a Ministry of Works and Housing project that gave us some enough confirmation that there's some work that's going on. Prior to this moment, this evening, there had been some earlier media reports that that, that area has already been redeveloped and there, there are apartments on, on the build at uh, that area already. What we confirmed this evening is that this place, which according to the, the neighbors of the late Justice Malfasal, is a residential facility. Yes, there's some work going on. The building that housed Justice Malfasal, the late, has been demolished. There's some project ongoing by the Ministry of Works and Housing. In fact, we got to know as well that there are three other facilities that had been demolished in that area, including the former residence of the current Minister for Works and Housing, Francis Asenso Boch. That's what we found out. So Francis Asenso Boch was living on that same stretch earlier. That building that he lived in has also been demolished under this same government redevelopment program that has seen a number of old government buildings demolished in prime areas like Osu Cantonment Ridge and these areas. Now, the notice of the facility, that's the project under the work of the Ministry of Works and Housing, as indicated right now, you see on the screen. This is what we found at the construction site. So, that is the information that we've got currently pertaining to this particular project at Onyasia Close. This area is called the Onyasia Close in Roman Ridge, here in Accra. This is the, the, the particular area that is in that controversy between Kenet Japon and Francis Asen Subwachi. These videos, we, we went to that area and we took this video some three hours ago. We'll see the evening shots. Because after receiving the statement and securing a copy of the contract, in fact, the agreement between the ministry and, and also the judicial service, we had to go beyond it to, to ascertain exactly what's going on. So indeed, there's some redevelopment going on at the former residence of the late Justice Mafosal. The building that he lived in has been demolished together with two other buildings one of which was described as the Minister for Western Housing's former residence, has also been demolished. And there's some redevelopment go taking place. But the judicial service says this is part of an agreement that they consented to for the Ministry and Western Housing, as you see on the screen there, to take and redevelop the area and have some four buildings allocated that is, bungalows allocated to the judicial service when the redevelopment program is completed in this area. So that's the information that we have right now on this. Now, if you recall yesterday, we spoke to the Member of Parliament for the War Central Constituency. He's a member of the Lands and Natural Resources Committee of Parliament, the Honorable Abdul Rashid Belpo, who was asking questions about this government redevelopment project, which has led to all what we are seeing. And, and the questions that Parliament itself has been asking and that committee as well, and the fact that they want more information. In some cases, they don't seem to be aware of exactly what's going on. Take a look. To tell you the truth, the committee is unaware of this policy. We are unaware of the practical implementation of it, which is giving governments 
the uh, the leeway to break down buildings and to sell out parts of buildings that has been uh, in possession of government for a very long time. Um, we, we watch it with a lot of worry and we are concerned that the details are not discussed with us and we wish that some more information is given to us as to exactly what they are doing and how they are implementing that policy. Then in ask the minister a question on the floor of parliament. Why the new interest in sale of lands, government lands, and uh, especially uh, in lands that are in prime areas and, uh, and, and those that already contain buildings? Um, he made reference to the fact that it's been a policy of old and that uh, he was just implementing a policy which had been carried to them. But that was not sufficient enough for us to explain, for him to explain why these kinds of places they are talking about are demolished, structures demolished, sold to individuals, as if government is very much uh, impatient to have its own land, or government is willing to discharge its own lands with the speed of light, as we are seeing, and it's not happening only in Accra, it's happening all over. You know, if you go to Ashanti, we have been told about it. If you go to Upper West Region, my region, is it's happening in Wa, it's happening in Greater Accra, it's happening in Volta Region, everywhere. I mean, there is an indecent set sale of lands, government lands to private individuals who are not necessarily in bad need of land to the extent that... Um, those lands should be sold to them. And my worry is not the fact that uh, plain lands lying somewhere are sold to individuals. My worry and our worry is that specific areas of lands in very prime areas in Accra and other places, you know, are being, are being sold out. And uh, when you find out exactly who are be, the, the lands are being sold to, many of them are people from within government. Um, we are definitely um, aware of a policy which individuals can benefit, where individuals seek to have lands. Some distant lands owned by government can be sold to them. And uh, many MPs, I'm sure, have made requests for those kinds of lands and have been sold to them. But lands that are in prime locations sold to individuals at prices that cannot be, that don't 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 match up with the, the value of the land, you know, is what we are worried about. So that's Rashid Bobo there. Here's what we're gonna do. Trust us here on Ghana tonight to stay the steam on this matter as we continue to knock on the doors of the irrelevant institutions and individuals who have to answer the fundamental questions of accountability and, and some level of clarity on what is going on, right? So tonight, we'll establish a few things. The specific residential facility of the late Justice Marfosal, the area we've just showed you on, live on, on Ghana tonight, plus the buildings that were demolished. In fact, there the are sources within the Ministry of Western Housing confirmed that indeed the former residence of the current Minister of Western Housing, Francis Nzubuachi, is part of the three buildings in this area we're showing you that were demolished for this redevelopment program to take place, which is going to see the building of modern apartments or bungalows for the judicial service. That it's the confirmation that we got based on the investigation that we, we conducted here on Ghana tonight. So what you're seeing right now is the residential facility um, that you, you have in, in there where the late Justice Mafosal was living and the works that is taking place as we speak. So stay with us here on Ghana tonight in, in the coming days, every step of the way as we continue to get some answers on this matter. And especially, as Parliament has also indicated, at least, a ranking member on the Lancet Forestry Committee of Parliament indicated that they are going to ask more questions. 
on what is going on with this redevelopment program. But let's stay a bit further um, this time around beyond what uh, the judicial service and also the works and housing ministry has said about something that Kenny Japon said. Beyond that, he's talked about, I mean, talking about Kenny Japon, uh, has also talked about the, the party, I mean, the NPP that he, the party he belongs to and what is happening in the Bantama constituency, plus the fact that he has concerns about certain members of parliament in some constituencies. But a former speaker of the legislature, and I'm talking about member of the NPP's Council of Elders, Professor Aaron Michael Coyne, is saying the party must call Kenny Japon to order. Well, exactly what does he mean by that? Take a look. He's a fine gentleman. But it's unfortunate that he decided to part company. That's, our, that's the word I'll use, unfortunate. And the utterances that came from him? Well, I like to learn, even from situations that I'm not happy about. And from that situation, I felt any further crack in the MPP would be disastrous. Therefore, we accommodated everything so as to hold our party together. After the complaints, certain complaints about round one, I said we strengthened the rules and we assured society we we're going to make it. Thank God we made it. On the election day, it was very, very smooth. No problem whatsoever, not a single complaint. And I'm telling you how we achieve that, by leaving security entirely to the police. If no matter your position, come, vote, and go. If you brought your security man there who has a gun, he must hand over immediately to the policeman in charge at that station. All these rules were printed and sent to everybody so that the, the so-called intimidation will not arise. I didn't believe in the intimidation, but some people talked about it. So you make a rule that will, will, will make everybody be satisfied and assured. And that is what was the essence of what we did. In life, you learn that even human rights situations, you always have to balance it. And some, in fact, it has been said that your human rights stops where somebody else's right starts. You know, so you must look at the society and the public interest as a whole and balance the equation to have peace and stability. What would you tell Kennedy Japan then with this statement you've made? Oh, beautiful about, the beautiful thing about it is that on that very night, Kennedy Japan made a public statement that the election was free and fair. But, His words. Yes, but going into the next one, you know, you know he's already talking and making some claims already about Senso Boachi and the rest. Oh, I think those ones are some personal issues. But in the interest of the party, I will think that the elders, which I'm one of, and the national executive must put it on their agenda to ensure that everybody is put to a certain order so that there will be peace and harmony for the so next election. you should have a conversation with him peacefully. With everybody, whenever certain unpleasant situations arise. Not him alone, whoever, yes. Should we expect that meeting soon? I, I think it should, it, should, it should happen soon. So that's Prof, Professor Errol Michael Quay in that exclusive interview with my colleague Beatrice Zedou there. Now, there's going to be more of it here on Ghana tonight in the coming days. But this call by Professor Errol Michael Quay to have the NPP reign persons who make certain statements in line ahead of the primaries is what Dr. Jonas Asantiochri is a political analyst, a lecturer at the University of Cape Coast, joining us on Zoom for a quick conversation on this. But Dr. Asantiochri, I found out your thoughts on this position as espoused by an elder of the MPP that, you know what, Kenny Japong and the others who make such statements um, ahead of the primaries, which is described to be one that would disturb the party, should be reined in. It appears the party, at least for the past five days after this video was made available of Kenny Japon making those 
allegations against Francis and Soboaji. Nothing has been heard of the party as yet, as in any action taking, not even a statement has been issued from the party. That posture of ignorance, is it going to help them? Well, uh, let me say good evening to our viewers. Um, sometimes it is better to behave as if you've not heard anything and ignore the ugly noises because if you go on a rabble rousing or as it were to investigate and come up with sanctions you are rather going to incur the displeasure of that particular person and if you listen to him carefully then you need to come to the conclusion that there are certain members within the party that are his target and therefore, if you are the flag bearer, and you know very well that if you should go on that tangent, it's going to affect the entirety of the campaign strategy that the party is going to adopt. It will definitely affect them. So sometimes you just have to ignore the ugly noises and see whether, you know, sleeping dogs will be lying. Other than that, you just open a canker that you may not uh, uh, be able to deal with. Well, I see. Some have also made the argument that knowing Kenny Japon, as he started this, he's not one that is going to stop anytime soon. He is going to continue um, because, as we have just made reference to, even with Francis Subwachi's allegation, the allegation against him, he has reiterated that he still stands by his position on, on that particular allegation as well. So if you say that, well, it's sometimes okay to ignore what you describe as ugly noises, for how long? Especially when this is not just a one-time statement Kenny Japan will make. He will continue. The way you look at it, the party is definitely going to get hurt. And I think that to tackle him head on, with sanctions and other things will not inure to the benefit of the party. The advance says he does not really have anything against the Tobaumia. But there are certain characters within the party that have impugned his integrity, and therefore you want to deal with them. But if you look at it carefully, you will have to appreciate where the man, where Kennedy Japan, Honorable Kennedy Japan is coming from. The point is that if he really wants to build his future career in terms of presidential ambition, then definitely he will have to play a role in ensuring that all these, you know, uh, people who have incurred his displeasure are removed from office. But here is the case that Obama will also have to come to the conclusion that these people that have incurred the displeasure of Mr. Kennedy Japan supported him. And if he is not careful, it will amount to some kind of betrayal. And for him to also you know, word into the whole fracas and the brouhaha, then he's equally going to incur Mr. Kennedy Japan's, you know, uh, displeasure. And so it's like uh, the flag is caught with the, with, between the deep blue sea and the hard rock. And uh, believe you me, certainly what he's doing. He will uh, ensure that Certain members of the okay. party do not come back. I, I, I'm losing you, but it's a bit cranky. But if you could reposition yourself so that we have this conversation. But if you talk about uh, the action to be taken or a consideration of it, even a statement has not been issued. Okay, after this statement by Kenny Japong, and we've seen this over the period. And I recall on Friday when I had that conversation with the Bantama chair of the party, the NPP in the Bantama constituency, he had indicated that by Saturday, which was just this Saturday gone by, they were going to issue a statement. That statement hasn't come. In fact, take a look at this. You are the party chair. Nothing has been heard from you, not even a statement from you as the chair of this constituency where this allegation has been made against a sitting member of parliament. So what's, what's, what's the plan? Definitely, we are going to issue a statement on this tomorrow. I was not in town. Actually, I was in Accra, and I go to Kumasi this evening. And the honorable member is still in Bantama. 
on a tour campaigning for his brother. So maybe, just maybe, he's going to finish his campaign today and then we can respond to all the allegations. But definitely we are going to have a press statement on these issues tomorrow. So he said, this was on Friday, what you just watched is on Friday, Dr. Satyotri. He said the next day, tomorrow, which is that Saturday gone by, a, a statement was going to be issued. Well, we're yet to, to see any statement from the, the Bantama chair of the MPP. Well, but we, we've seen others who have also um, gone on the same path of making certain statements and the party has issued a statement or sanctioned them or some kind of punishment as well. So is this going to embolden others to, to go on the same path? S certainly, you are right. Because the two of us can go and steal plantain. But in terms of... Uh, you know, going around the law, I may be able to procure for my, from I may be able to procure a lawyer for, to, to run the affairs, to run my affairs, but you may not have a lawyer. In the end, you can go in for five years. I may even go in for just six months or some two days, or I may even go scot-free. And so the part uh, between Canada, Japan, and some members of parliament who was who will want to retain their seats in terms of the prime minister? Uh, the, the, we... the, I, 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 I'm sorry. I'm really sorry. But I, we, I, I understand the point. I think the point is pretty clear um, about how, what, the posture and how this will impact on the party going forward. But thank you so much for joining us. I apologize for that uh, poor connection to Dr. Jonathan Sanchochre. He is a political analyst and lecturer at the University of Cape Coast joining us here on Ghana tonight. Coming up next, Labour reacts to John Domani Mohamed's plea for a honeymoon should the National Democratic Congress win the 2024 presidential election. It would appear that Labour unions are not in sync with the NDC flag bearer uh, what, with this plea that he's made that, you know what, be reasonable in your demands if I win power after the 2024 elections. We have the Ghana Registered Nurses and Midwife Association joining us, plus the president of Imani Africa, Franklin Kujo, will also be joining us here on Ghana tonight on this statement by John Mahama after this quick break. Stay with us. Welcome back. This is Ghana Tonight. We're live on TV Ghana on Facebook, DSV Channel 279, all across the world on 3news.com. Now, the Trade Union Congress is saying that Ghanaian workers will continue to make demands from politicians, despite the appeal by the former president, John Romani Mahama, for the uh, labor unions to be merged in, in their demands. Now, according to the TUC, politicians have contributed to the collapse of the economy and any plea by the flag bearer of the NDC for workers to be reasonable in their demands after he wins power in 2024 or the, will not be accepted. The Deputy Secretary General of the TUC, Joshua Ansa, spoke with our Labour correspondent, Daniel Opoku, in Accra earlier today. But first, let's establish this. Let's hear from the flag bearer of the NDC, John Mahama, specifically what he said uh, that is, if he wins by in 2024, what he expects of labor unions. Take a look. And I'll plead with the teachers' unions, Nats and Nagrat and Utag and Tewu and all of them. I know all of you are clamoring for allowances, increase in your allowances and so on and so forth. Let me caution you that in 2025, Inshallah, after we take over, we will show you the books and the finances of this country. And you realize, and you realize the harm that the MPP administration has done to Ghana's economy. This country is broke. And so we would beg you that when we come into office, give us a bit of a honeymoon. Let's put things in place so that we can bring the economy back on its feet. And when we have done that, we can uh, accede to your demands again. Well, so that's exactly what John Mahama said at, on that campaign platform. But there's been a number of reactions. This is uh, Professor Ransford Jampo, 
who is the president of the University of Ghana chapter of the University Teachers Association of Ghana, UTAG. This is what he said, he posted earlier. Take a look at this. He says, we hope government wouldn't be seen or be heard talking, telling labor to tighten the belt while you, that is in this case addressing John Mahama and your appointees will be living in opulence as we keep seeing now. So what is going to be the size of the government? Are they going to be selling vehicles that may be bequeathed to them by the current administration? I mean, if some of these things are done, we will not get the support of, of from labor. So that is just portions of uh, Professor Ransford Jampo's you know, response uh, on this plea or this appeal by John Mahama. Well, Deputy Secretary General of the TUC, Joshua Ansa, who spoke with our Labour correspondent, Daniel Poko, in Accra earlier today, also had this to say. If you know the country is broke, why do you go for something that is broke? So you have to brace yourself fully to ensure that you take that broken country from wherever it is and ensure that you can do it. That's why you are calling people to vote for you to become a president. So we want to encourage him, if only he want to become the president of this very country. He should be fully prepared. He should read our manifesto, Dito Dito. He should know what, what workers of this very country want. Then, I mean, you find it, you have it very easy and very collaborative. Well, let's stay with some labor responses. Dr. David Tinkrang Chum is General Secretary of the Ghana Reset Nurses and Midwife Association. Thank you for joining us here on Ghana Channel. And I'm also welcome Franklin Kujo, is uh, President of Humani Africa. Gentlemen, good evening. Thank you for joining us here on Ghana Channel. Start off with you, uh, Dr. David Tinkrang Chum. Now, this is what John Mahama is saying. If I win, I'll show you the books of this country so you know that the country is broke. Give me a breathing space and then... I would meet your demands. But for the honeymoon period, be reasonable in your demands. What is the regional nurses, that's the Ghana Registered Nurses and Midwife Association reaction to this? Good evening, my brother. Good evening to your viewers and listeners. Uh, I think um, every government will want to enjoy uh, some sort of honeymoon in it in any time that they come to office. But you just have to find out how he left us. Mr. Mahama is not a new person. His Excellency, the ex-president, is not a new person at all. We, we, we've, we've known him and he's been the president of this country before. Um, the question you ask yourself is that how did he leave nurses and midwives? Okay, that is the most important question you need to ask. Uh, did we do well under his government? If we didn't do well, then his call is misplaced. I see. But if he, sh if he opens the books and he shows you that indeed, uh, as he's saying, that he's going to open the books so you see uh, what the state of the country is. And then based on that, makes that appeal that you should be reasonable in your demands. Would that influence or change your position or response in any way? He opens the books to us and his ministers will not be paid then we will understand that he's here to sacrifice. But if they will run the country the way they did so some years ago when he was in government, then we will not heed to that call. And as a matter of fact, we are already struggling. Okay, health workers, especially nurses. Look at how nurses and midwives are, you know, living in groups. So I expect something better. If we really want to come and rule this country again, and he expects nurses and midwives, and for that matter, health workers, to rally behind him, then he should say something different. Because our people are living, the few ones who are here are breaking their back. If you don't have anything for us, <laughs> I think Mr. Mahama must uh, come again. I see. What, what, what level of reasonability would you attach to the demands if it should be, or this plea from him, or this appeal from him is going to be considered by the Ghana Registered Nurses and Midwives Association? Demands have always been reasonable. We live in this economy and we know how the economy was struggling under his government and under this government. So demands of labor have always been reasonable. The only thing is that they don't prioritize labor. They don't prioritize health workers in this country. 
And there's a reason why people are living in droves. Okay? So if they don't care about the health needs of the people of Ghana, then they will be talking the way they are talking. We have always made reasonable demands, especially necessary midwives. This is not where we are supposed to be at all. Okay? Somebody leaves the shores of Ghana, and within six months, the amount of money that person will accrue will be more than what you can get in 10 years in Ghana. I mean, where are we going? So I think that Mr. Mahama must prioritize the health needs of this country and put some premium on health workers. If you remember, I shared something with you that it was during his time that they froze our market premium. And that is why nurses and midwives are leaving Ghana in ropes because all the gains we made under the single spine were whittled away. All right. So today, if he's telling us again that we should tighten our belt or we should be reasonable in, in our demands, then I, I don't know what to say. But as I, it, I mentioned earlier on, our demands have always been reasonable. And we continue to make reasonable demands, whether him or any other government. Okay. Now, let me bring in Franklin Kujo. He is president of and founder of Imani Africa, governance and policy think tank. Mr. Kujo, good evening. Thank you for joining us. Now, you've had uh, the Ghana Resident Nurse and Midwives Association General Secretary position quite clear. TUC is following on the same path. Now, you posted something earlier, given an idea of how 2025 is going to look like for any government or any party that wins the 2024 election. This is it. That's for the benefit of our viewers. This is what you posted, that I think it is important to be very careful how we want to deal with this economy. I pity the next president of this country because what it means is that you are going to deal with nonsense of taxes. Now, and it ties into that, that picture, the concern that John Mahama is talking about, about you know, opening up the books for labor to see the state of the economy that he's going to inherit if he wins 2024 election. Now... What, what exactly did you see in the crystal ball you looked at that made you conclude that whoever wins 2024, you pity that president? Well, thank you very much. I mean, this came on the back of the recent hikes in the electricity prices, the VAT on electricity consumption. And I thought that, well, we've reached the, having to reach the Senate of taxes in this country. I've lost count of the number of taxes we already have. And don't forget, we've run an economy into the ground and uh, we've been trying to salvage it through a lot of taxation. And uh, and I thought that the next administration may not even have the opportunity to tax it in at all because this administration has taxed us almost to, to a halt. Um, so it was in that spirit that I, I mentioned that the next administration must be pitied because clearly speaking, if it has, the, if it has plans to develop this country through taxation, then I'm sure people will start asking questions as to whether we haven't really reached the Senate of taxation in this country, um, which means that the next administration must do a lot of hard work, must rationalize the taxation system we have right now and decide whether they want to continue to grow the, grow the economy through enterprise support, uh, which would mean that they would have to relax some of the taxes, taxes that we already have, or they may have to rationalize the taxes that we have right now in order to ensure that the productive elements of the economy are, are protected and then encouraged to grow. Um, otherwise, as we all know, we are in a bind right now and the economy is, I mean, it's not going to be better until about 2028. At least that's the, that's, that's the forecast we, 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 we know, right? So it was in that spirit that I gave this particular, um, not necessarily a warning or a forewarning, but essentially, what is what is expected in the week? So that's 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 that's. that's. I, I, I see. But so essentially, what you're saying is that every part of our lives have been taxed um, as we speak now, so much that any government that comes in will, will not even have any space to even tax us, <laughs> the Ghanaian people, because we're burdened with taxes right now. I'll be wondering which other areas of the economy will be taxed, except, of course, the next government may be more intelligent to say that they want to bring in a lot more. But, you know, even for me, that argument 
somehow I have issues with it because if it is VAT, everybody pays a little bit. I mean, if it's a flat tax like it, I mean, if it's a VAT, people pay. So, um, yes, they may have to be much more um, clever, but I think that if they try to tax the already known persons that are taxed in this economy, much more those who deliver the goods up to us, I mean, the business people, small and medium enterprises, people who are breaking their backs to make ends meet, who are, who, are, who are noticed all the time and taxed, then we are not going to go anywhere. You know, already, I, I think President Mahama uh, thinks, of course, that he's, he's, he's going to be the likely candidate. And he's already asking for some reprieve, asking for some honeymoon that in the event that he wins, Daniel should bear with him while he tries to correct whatever wrongs there are in the system. I mean, those are the kinds of thoughts that I was expressing, that aside the, well, the accusations of rot, which would have to be uncovered, by the way, it is also the case that the economy as we speak right now is in a total spin ring. And uh, anyone who wants to conduct the affairs of this country from 2025 uh, must be well advised that there must be a thinking outside of the box if indeed, of course, thinking within the box would mean that they have to also rationalize the current taxes that they came to meet in order to grow the economy. I believe a number of them can be rationalized and, you know, uh, especially on the expenditure side, things could be done. I mean, this administration, for instance, while it is telling us to get up our loans and burden share, has voted for the Office of Government Machinery 100% raise in its, in its spending in 2024. I mean, who does that? You know, so maybe... If the next administration wants to prevent further taxation and then prevent the further killing of the economy and enterprise, they may well within they may well begin a rationalization of expenditure patterns in this country. And then maybe why not? Um something could give, really. At least I've heard Muhammad suggest that he's gonna work with system ministers. Well, uh, beyond system ministers, we also don't want to hear of flamboyant projects and all kinds of fictitious things that politicians like to do when they are giving power. So let's see. Um, at this at this juncture, is uh, we are hoping against hope, really. Right, uh, hoping again. But in fact, you you the reference you made to the labor unions, um, Mr. Franklin Kujo, and the that plea to them. Well, we've been speaking to some of them, and in fact, the general secretary of the Registered Nurses and Midwives Association is on. Spoke just before you did that they are going to continue to make their demands regardless of this plea by John Mahama and, and that they should make reasonable demands. I mean, from your perspective as, as a governance and an expert in an economics for that matter, if John Mahama makes this statement that, you know what, 2025 or this election, if I win, I'm going to open the books to you, see what is in there, and that may influence your demands to be reasonable. Then Labour says, you know what, this, this is not going to happen because politicians have subjected this economy to a lot of abuse at the expense of the Ghanaian people. How does that strike you? I, I suppose he's thinking about the reality. He, he probably doesn't know the death of the, of, of, of the carnage that, is, that exists as we speak. Uh, don't forget, there have been a number of decisions taken that had only come to light recently. You know, as they say, when the frog dies, you know it's full length. Uh, assuming this administration gets kicked out of power, that's when you know the exact, the exact nature of the scandal we are dealing with. Because as we speak, uh, as we know, there's been just too much, you know, how, how do I even put it? Uh, we've spent so much of people's savings, spent so much government money on projects that I'm sure we are still paying for, and those ones that are yet to be uncovered. So maybe he's probably being careful, um, trying to say that he's going to hit the ground running immediately he comes to power. I mean, potentially, if he comes to power, uh, and that he, everything will be nirvana. I, I think he's trying to warn people that it's not going to be sweet immediately, he became, he became, assuming he became president, right? But I can understand labor unions. Um, I mean, we've, if you've gone through the kinds of uh, challenge that you've gone through in this economy, what you what you really want to hear is not someone telling you that wait for me let me let me let me <laughs> let me settle uh, they think that you may be settling in forever and you may not be able to act within time 
I think that the pres President Mahama, if indeed he's the potential leader, must have within him some sort of an emergency rescue plan, as you speak. His, his cabinet to be must start thinking of those things even before he became president, mm -hmm. right? That is if people voted for him. So this excuse, while well, I understand it, at least in, in the form that means that you don't know the candidate that the system to be are come to power, he must also, he must by now understand the, the enormity of the, of, the, of the challenge and then plan for it. That's what I'll say. And by, by the way, by planning for it, I think he's already started making some interesting uh, concessions, uh, rationalizing the government, as in reducing the size of government, as in foregoing Article 71 emoluments. Uh, these are simple but important steps. And I think that if he's able to do a proper calculation of what these things cost us uh, as an economy, and from day one, he sets his sights in such a way that he's able to cut at least a third of this largesse of this waste. He may well be, the, be within his rights to, you know, start, you know, um, settling in. And right. that is what maybe labor unions will see and say, okay, well, he kept his word. But, you know, politicians are like uh, the weather. You never know when they'll change. But let's see. You never know. Mama may just change. So <laughs> you never know. And, and, well, I want to say thank you. Thank you so much for joining us here on Ghana tonight. And Franklin Kujo, really do appreciate your time. Franklin Kujo is uh, founding president of Imani Africa. And so to you as well, Dr. Uh, also, we have the General Secretary of the Ghana Registered Nurses and Midwives Association, Dr. Tinkran Chum. Thank you as well for joining us here on Ghana tonight. On behalf of the rest of the team, I thank you for staying with us. And make a date same time tomorrow. I am Alfred Akansi. Have a good night.